And tonight is part five. Uh, then he answered and spake unto me, Zechariah 4, 6, Thus, or this is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel. I also happen to believe it's the word of the Lord to Norfolk Apostolic Church as well. <laughs> Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. So we have been talking about for four weeks now about engaging the spirit and tonight is going to be part five of that I'm going to take a interesting turn into a slightly different direction I want to talk to us tonight about things that we do whether we are conscious of it or not that attract the spirit world for good or for bad. That's what I want to talk about tonight. And uh, I believe this is part of uh, dealing with the issue of engaging the Spirit. It's something we need to understand. So I want to ask you to lay your Bible down for a moment. And I would like you to lift your voice unto the Lord and give Him praise right now and pray also for this message. In Jesus' name, Lord, we've come to teach the Word of God tonight. As pastor of this church, and I'm asking you to help me tonight to deliver the things that you have put into my spirit to do. Help me be my help my mind and my mouth be the voice of the pages tonight. In Jesus' name. God bless you. You may be seated in the name of Jesus. And everybody said amen. Uh, we have been talking about engaging. The Spirit, and mostly, up until now, we have been talking about the various ways that God communicates to us, and uh, spent a lot of time addressing dreams and visions, various things. But tonight, I want to tread into a very interesting area. I want to talk about what attracts or repels the spirit world. And when I say spirit world, I, I am, uh, I'm talking about both good or bad. I'm talking about the angels of the Lord or even demon spirits. Uh, maybe I would say it this way. Uh, is there anything that we do in our day-to-day -day life that draws spiritual attention to us even if it happens to be unwittingly. Uh, now, one thing I want to say is this. The, you know, there's an old saying that says there is no accounting for taste. And uh, basically what that means is you cannot explain necessarily why, you know, people have a certain taste for something or what attracts people. I've often said uh, if I knew what it was that drew people together and, and what attracted them about each other, and so I'd write a book and retire. <laughs> It'd be a bestseller. Because <laughs> sometimes it just seems inexplicable. Uh, one man's trash is another man's cash. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what makes certain people attracted to other people and this that and the other and and but 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 I, but I do understand the concept there's there's no accounting for taste in other words it's not a right or wrong it's it's just a matter of uh what is a preference we do know this birds of a feather flock together i'm just on bromides here to start with <laughs> um and again, some people are attracted to each other. Now, I, I, I do know that some things that we can do will attract carnality. For example, indulging in the flesh. Immodesty will draw attention to you whether you wanted it or not. Okay? And indulging in the flesh will attract the spirit world. And... You know, we need to understand spirits in, in the Bible are named, you know, angels, if you've ever noticed, were given names uh, at times. Most of the time when demon spirits are referred to, there's 
rarely uh, a specific name given as much as a characteristic or a trait, such as the spirit of fear, the spirit of lust, okay? the spirit of this, that, or the other. And, and, and the reason that they're called that is because they are, uh, they are they're discussing what this spirit uh, promotes and I might add what it's attracted to. So if there are certain things that you and I can do or do that attract the spirit world to us, whatever it is that we attract will endeavor to engage us. And then if it can engage us, for example, a spirit of fear, for example, you can have fear and fear, it, it, it attracts a spirit of fear. If you're having a lust issue, it will attract a spirit of lust toward you. And that spirit world will endeavor to engage. And if it's able to engage us, it becomes, it becomes like uh, in the old days there used to be roller derby. Uh, the younger generation probably wouldn't know what it is, but, but, it, but if you played ro roller derby, if you ever, you reach out and took the hand of somebody and you'd whip them around, you know, then they'd come around and, and, and the whole point is, is, is that you would just try to, you know, whip it around. Well, when you engage the spirit world, whichever it is, it becomes like a game of roller derby. In that, lust, for example, will engage the spirit of lust. When the spirit of lust engages you, it'll take that level of lust you were toying with and it'll whip it to a further level. And then when it draws the flesh into a further level, then that in, in turn attracts the more of that spirit. And, and it gets like a dog chasing its tail going in circles uh, and, it gets like a, and it just gets stronger until, and you can apply this, by the way, to any of the spirits, but you wake up one day and you're, and you're not just having a, a problem, you're bound. And the only way that can break you free of it is you have to be delivered. Because you're in bondage. Now there is something that obviously that is, the Bible talks about that is demon possession. And I would say that demon possession is much more common than, than most people think. As a matter of fact, I would generally say if you work in the public uh, or interact with the public at all, whether school, you know, shipyard, this, that, or whatever, you're going to uh, you're going to encounter in the course of your day. I would guarantee you that every one of you, more than likely, this week have encountered somebody that is demon possessed, and you just may not have known it. On the other hand, you may have known it. <laughs> uh, so it's much more common than we think, but. There's another thing called demon oppression. Now, oppression is even more common. It's incredibly common to the point that I would say that everyone tangles with demon oppression because we are spirit beings. And when the spirit world endeavors to engage us, it, it, it will do it through an oppression. It'll start to lean in, so to speak, so hover over us, surround us, try to uh, massage us into a direction. Now, I'm going to present some things tonight that I'm, I will be honest with you. Some of you are not going to be able to grasp it. And if you bring up Romans 8, I'll explain why. Uh, that it's going to be hard for you to grasp it. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. And to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And because the carnal mind is enmity against God, it's not subject to the law of God, neither can indeed can be. And so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Now I'm, I'm going to say even in the church there are some of you that are not always able to grasp certain things that are taught and challenged to you because your mind, even though you've come to church and you've been baptized, and this and that, but you still toy with too much carnality. And your mind still is ruled more times than not in a carnal way of thinking than it is a biblical way of thinking. So in other words, your brain is still wired a little too quickly toward carnality and people that are like that are going to uh, uh, tend to mock 
things such as holiness and various things that are taught because they'll look at you and say, oh, that, that doesn't make any sense. And the truth is, they're not lying. They truly don't get it. Because their mind is having trouble embracing something that is spiritual in its nature. Now, this happened to even to Jesus. Bring up uh, John 8 on screen. This is Jesus talking. He said, why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. Now, he explains what their problem was. He said, you are of your father, the devil. And the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He abode not in truth, because there's no truth in him. And when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Now, I'm, I'm simply pointing out that Jesus confronted the uh, culture of his day with the exact same thing I just said. He said, I'm telling you the truth, but you can't grasp it. And it's because your mind is still being led, it's still engaged by carnal spirits. It's being led by spirit. Bring up Isaiah 55. Now, I want you to understand, you know, God thinks different than us. Surely I could get an amen out of that. <laughs> Dear Lord. <laughs> but, uh, but let me show you just how much. <laughs> Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Yet uh, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord. And he said, I'll have mercy upon him, to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. God is saying, I invite you, come. He said, but you've got to lay down the carnality. You cannot pursue me and be carnal, is what God's telling us. For my thoughts, verse 8, are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. And, and just so that we're clear, verse 9, he said, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. What God was literally saying to us is the reason that you cannot comprehend some of the things that I'm telling you is because my way of thinking is so superior to yours. Think a three-year-old. Versus a, 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 uh, a, a Ph.D. And you look and say, can they communicate? Well, yeah, but, but you know, a little kid can't even begin to, to comprehend things on the level of the adult. Well, you take that and multiply it a thousand times and maybe we're getting to where it is between God and us. Now, I say all that to say this. God does not have to explain to us why he prefers certain things. <laughs> he just does. You say, well, I want to know why. It's highly possible you couldn't understand it if he tried to explain it. <laughs> but again, going back to my original statement, there's no accounting for taste. It's not an issue of, of, of saying, no, this is a good thing or that's a bad It's just that, look, uh, why does a person prefer mashed potatoes to au gratin potatoes? Or fried potatoes? Or whatever. Why do some people like lima beans over green beans? That's because you're sick. <laughs> I mean, I don't mind lima beans, but not next to some good old green beans. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but 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 why? You know, why 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 do some prefer baked beans? And, and no no no, I like uh, I like uh, mac and cheese. And, and 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 you know, now you can you can get into a fist fight if you want to with somebody to try to explain why your tastes are better than their tastes, but that's a fool's errand. Because at the end of the day, no one really owes you an explanation 
for why they prefer a certain taste over another except to say that I just do. Why do some people prefer blondes? Other people prefer brunettes. Why do some like Asian and others are attracted to uh, Hispanic culture? What, the list could go on. Why this? Why that? There isn't a right or wrong. Here's the point. It depends, though. What you do depends on what, you, what your taste is and what it is you decide to pursue. If you have a preference or a taste, then you will tend to pursue that. But you have to decide just how strongly are you going to pursue it. And, and I would flip it to the other side to say it this way. Uh, it depends on what or who you're trying to please. As to why you and I might make certain decisions the way we do. Now, here's one thing you need to understand. Lucifer and Jesus have completely different tastes. Some of you are so carnal, I have lost you already. <laughs> Lucifer and Jesus have completely different tastes. And so it's important, if you're interested in pleasing one or the other, you need to try to put some effort into try to figuring out and learning what some of those likes and dislikes are so that you might want to endeavor to incorporate some of them. By the way, that's the whole premise of the Because We're His series. That's online. And I want to say, some of us, I've been watching a little bit. I see some of you beginning to drift because I haven't preached from the pulpit. What, what is, what, why? What is it about that? Why can't we stay focused on, on, do you ever make up your mind about anything? <laughs> is everything that you believe on the block for reconsideration if somebody doesn't hammer it every six months? <laughs> That's immaturity. The whole premise of the Because of His series about holiness or social separation is founded on the reality that we are endeavoring to, to understand that there are some things that God likes better than other things. And it's an issue of endeavoring to please God. Everything is not a direct heaven or hell issue, but many things can become indirectly those issues because of, of how we decide to approach them. Some people come to church, at least at first, simply because they just want to avoid hell. But they never really learn to fall in love with Jesus. And so everything about their walk is just the minimum I've got to do to stay out of hell. But there's never a, a, a maturity and a growth that comes in that says, but I, I want to please him. I want to attract his spirit. I want to attract the angels of the Lord. The Bible says they encamp around about those that fear. I don't, I don't want to be at odds with my angels. <laughs> I don't want to grieve them. I want my security detail to be happy. <laughs> if you never develop a desire to please God, then you will never be interested in any second mile scenario. And by that I mean in Matthew 5 when Jesus said, Whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him a second mile. The first mile you were compelled to. That's what was preached to you. That's what you were challenged to do. But once you've figured out the pattern... The second mile I do on my own. But you'll never be interested in second mile scenarios if you don't ever have a desire to attract 
the holy. And you cannot pursue God seriously by only doing bare minimums. Can't do it. So I'm going to take just a moment because I'm going to spend more time on the other. But how do I attract God's Spirit? How do I attract the Holy Spirit? Well, there's several things, but... Uh, there, there's, there's giving, there's faith, of course. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. He's attracted to faith. Repentance, oh man, that'll get God's attention. I'll tell you the biggest overall, outside of faith itself, is humility. Real quick, bring up on screen, Psalms 51. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, thou will not despise. If you and I can approach him with, with humility, it will draw the spirit, it will attract the spirit of God. Humility does not attract demon spirits. Pride and arrogance attracts demon spirits. And boy, if they can engage that, they'll take it to levels you never thought of on your own. James 4, on screen. You ask, talking about prayer, and you receive not. Because, everybody say because. You ask amiss that you can consume it upon your lust. In other words, you're seeking God to please yourself rather than Him. Everything's about what I want. He went on to say in verse 4, You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. That means enemy. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Here's why. You cannot be accepted by both. Because you can't please both. Because... They are driven by two different tastes. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, now watch, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, he'll flee from you, draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh unto you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, uh, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. These are the things that attract the Spirit of God. And when you're hungering after God, when you're trying to get, walk with God, when you're trying to get close to God, when you're trying to increase in your knowledge of God, you've got to learn that what God's tastes are. And then endeavor... To pursue them. Now we understand that it is impossible for us to pursue the state of holiness or righteousness on our own. That's just works. It's filthy rags. Uh, but the thing is, the separation from the world is something I can do. And then God takes that thing and becomes pleased with it and then imputes it unto us uh, for righteousness sake. And so God... With His aid, we become holy. With His aid, we become righteous. Uh, because God is attracted to those uh, who will present themselves in a certain way. And the same things that attract the Holy Spirit repel demonic spirits. And vice versa. The Word of God shows us that there's some things that please God and some things that displease God and then we have a choice to act on it and again you need to go back and listen to because we're his it's on the front page of the website like a dozen lessons on various subjects but now I, I, I so I, that's we talked about a lot of that and because we're his about what attracts him so let me take a few moments tonight and discuss what kind of things are going to tend to attract the demonic more so than the holy? Classic example uh, that's very clear. Bring up, uh, turn, turn with me to 1 Corinthians 11. And this is the chapter where Paul deals with two major doctrines. Communion, which uh, all the church world still embraces. And then before we even got to communion, he taught on headship which we have tried to avoid like the plague. But Paul says in verse 3, I would have you to know 
that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of every woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesied with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head. For that is even all as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it's a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her also be covered. Uh, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image, here's the reason, and the glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither is the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Now watch this. Here's why I'm reading all this tonight. Because it goes right to verse 10 when he says, For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Because there are certain things that attract the holy. Now, I, there's an entire Bible study uh, about uh, if God cares about our hair, it's all in because we're His. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time in that tonight. But the reason that we teach and challenge and encourage our women to, to practice stop cutting their hair is because we have found in the Word that there is this, it's something that, that has a tendency to attract the, the, the angelic. It attracts the spirit world, the kind of spirits that we're wanting to attract. Skip down to verse 13. Judge in yourselves. Is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a woman have long hair, it is a shame? Uh, I'm sorry, if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. And again, we, we deal with all of that in depth, and because we're his. The point I'm simply trying to make tonight is that there are things that we can do or not do, that attract the spirit world. And the spirit world is paying attention more so than us. It's not not a big deal to us. Not in our particular, well, in our culture, it doesn't seem like anything's a big deal anymore. (laughs) But I will tell you this. One of the ways you can tell what interests the spirit world is to not only read the Word of God and observe what it says there, but also to observe the cultic world and watch the kind of stuff they do. Because every time they find something that they believe is pleasing to God, they do the opposite. Because that's what spirit drives it. That's why this whole thing about unisex, dress and so forth, all of that, by the way, that we bought into as a culture 50 years ago is now exploding into transgenderism and bathrooms. But it, it, All of that is just nothing but demon possession stuff. And a culture that is so biblically ignorant of biblical knowledge, they, they're, they're buying into it because they, they, well, because, and the more you buy into it, the more you attract it. We're living in a time that it's just, it's unprecedented in America. But there's certain things that are trust. In this case, he said the angels are. And it's why cultists do the opposite. Unisex is driven by spirits. Homosexuality is driven by spirits. And the more you tinker with it, the more it'll get a hold of you. And if you think that you can toy with stuff that is clearly... We're clearly told to avoid. That's pride and arrogance. And that's driven by a spirit as well. You see, folks, sometimes God warns us of things because of the spiritual consequences it has, even though He knows we may not understand that. That's why He just tells us to trust us. Because sometimes we toy with stuff that we don't understand. And that's why He said, My people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. I'll give you an example. Uh, dealing with idols and graven images. You say, oh, well, we don't do that anymore. Hang on. You might be surprised. What you thought we did away with, our generation has perfected. <laughs> I want to invite you to bring up uh, Leviticus 19. 
on screen. Verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And you shall fear every man his mother and his father, and keep my Sabbaths, for I am the Lord your God. Turn ye not unto idols, nor make to yourselves molten gods, for I am the Lord your God. Now again, there's no specific statement given by God here that explains his preference. He just says, because I'm God. And before you think that that's, that's rude, any of you that's ever been a parent know how many times you have to invoke that. <laughs> Because your little kids ask you stuff that you, you're, it's not that you're not willing to explain, but you know you're wasting your time because they're not going to get it. And so, but why? And, and eventually, after you wear out with all of the trying, you'll just say, because I said so. And that better be good enough. And there are some things in the Word that God doesn't try to explain. He says, because I said because I am the Lord thy God. Anything Satan thinks pleases God, will, he will cause to be attracted to, or displeases God, excuse me. He'll, he'll try to attract popular culture to it. And, and if you want to see what's happening in when spirits are loosed upon a culture and watch where it's driven to, and I'm telling you, in the last 25 years, uh, whether you understood it or not, you've had a front row seat in American culture. It's insane. Deuteronomy chapter 7. The graven images of their gods shall ye burn with fire, and thou shalt not desire the silver or the gold that is on them, nor take it unto thee, lest thou be snared therein. Now that really gets to the reason why God tells us some of this stuff. I don't want you to toy with this because it is set there to be a snare. It doesn't mean that everybody that has done it is snared. It said, but it's there to snare. And so God says, leave it alone. He said, there, he, he said uh, lest you be snared. It's an abomination to the Lord thy God. Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it. But thou shalt utterly detest it, and thou shalt utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. Now hear me tonight. Any time in the scripture when you hear that something is cursed, that has spirit world connotations. We don't have the power as flesh to curse flesh. I mean, you know, the, the, the closest thing we got to it is that we call, when we cuss somebody, it's called cursing. But it's not really having the impact unless you get entangled with occultic spirits and you start learning the power of words and so forth. And then, but when you curse something, it's because it's been prayed over and that, that demons or, uh, you know, the flip side could be God's spirit, has been attached. It's been assigned to it. And we can hinder our own self by constantly tinkering with the wrong things. Do you know that sometimes toy companies and different people ha have, have put out toys that have been cursed and prayed over by occultists and so forth and, 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 and sought, uh, put out into the community for demonic powers? That they're trying to teach the next generation how to attract the spirit world. So like the world does, it paints things up that's fun. It's fun. For example, Pokemon. I, I, I don't know how some of these people get into this. Like I'm thinking, don't you have a job? <laughs> Number one, first thing you need to get delivered from Pokemon is a job. <laughs> but it comes from the two Japanese words, poketo and Monsut, and it means pocket monster. And it is specifically, the people who design it, specifically are attached to occultism. And I, I'm going to read you a brief 
paragraph from a, an article in Charisma magazine, Christian magazine. And I quote, and it was about Pokemon, and it says, uh, The Pokemon are supposed to be monsters and have special powers and share the world with humans. The idea of the game is to have children learn how to collect as many Pokemon as possible, train them, and use them against other people's Pokemon by invoking the various abilities of each Pokemon creature. Pokemon can evolve and pass through various levels, 100 being the highest. Colored energy cards are sometimes used to aid the Pokemon. And so they go on. It said, is Pokemon dangerous? Their answer is, well, potentially yes. Because it conditions the child who plays the game into accepting occultic and evolutionary principles. Again, it's about opening the mind to be receiving other things. Because whenever you engage a spirit or a spirit engages you, it will never leave you in the condition it found you. It will draw you into something deeper. Hunter the, uh, can hypnotize, eat a person's dreams, and drain their energy. Abra reads minds. Kadabra emits negative energy and harms others. Uh, Ghastly induces sleep. Gangar laughs at people's fright. Nordoran uses poison. The psychic type of Pokemon are among the strongest of the game. Uh, Charmander and, and Hunter and a couple of these I don't even know how to pronounce I'll skip them <laughs> that's what you do <laughs> um, the children are taught to use the, the creatures to do their will by invoking colored energy cards uh, flights and commands which is reminiscent of occult and eastern mysticism now it switches and says this is why we feel like this is a problem because it is a training ground for what the actual cultists do the magician, this is what they really, works from within a specially prepared magic circle which supposedly protects him from the demon as long as he stays inside it. He uses special magical weapons like a wand, a staff, or a sword to threaten the demon and to make it do his or her bidding. And once the ritual is successful, supposedly the demon belongs to the magician to do his or her bidding as long as the stipulations of their contract are kept by the sorcerer. Often the demon will grant the magician occult powers uh, to give him or her special talisman, talismans uh, to control others. This is a large part of high magic. Now, here's the, here's the last sentence I'll quote from, from that article. It says, now, there is barely a dime's worth of difference uh, between this and what goes on in make-believe in the Pokemon universe. Now, I would present to you, there's a lot of people that are, that are people of God even, who have unwittingly done things that are attracting problematic spirits into their homes because they never bothered to think about something other than following culture like a Pied Piper. Bring up Joshua chapter 6. And ye, in any wise, keep yourselves from the accursed thing lest you make yourselves accursed. And when you take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse uh, and trouble it, but all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord, they shall come into the treasury of the Lord. Now, wh what he's saying is, uh, the reason God is saying, I want you to do this, uh, I don't want you to take in accursed things, because if you toy with accursed things, uh, you're going to become accursed yourself. Because there are things that we can do that attract or agitate, whatever verb you want to use, they attract the spirit world. They will begin to engage the spirit world. John 4. This is, this is an amazing statement Jesus made. He said, you worship, but you know not what. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews, but the hour cometh and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Uh, but it's a powerful statement when Jesus said there's a whole lot of worshiping going on that people don't even know what they're worshiping. 
And they're, they're entangling themselves with spiritual issues that are damaging their homes and undermining everything they're trying to do in their faith. Uh, and, and they do these things most of the time because of ignorance. But once we have been taught, we need to change some of this. Another example is music. Huge example. The kind of music that you listen to. It is a major area of spiritual engagement. As a matter of fact, music itself really is a spiritual medium. And anybody that is a high-end musician will even talk, tell you about the spiritual experience that, that, that comes uh, when you get lost in the music. And many people who are, have become highly successful in worldly music, so many of them, you know by their testimonies, they, they get high, they do drugs, they do all kinds of stuff because they're saying, I, I'm trying to get into another, man, my music goes to a higher level when I'm, when I'm high. Or when I, when, you know, it's interesting because nothing else goes to a higher level when you're high. <laughs> So you ask yourself, how is it I can produce this exceptional stuff when I'm high? That's because you have engaged a spirit. And it's the spirit world that's aiding you in this. And you thought it was a drug. All the drug did is open you up. Because it's attracted to it. Absolutely. Absolutely has a spiritual component. It changes moods. It opens us up to ideas. As a matter of fact, when you study the Word of God, you find out that Lucifer was at one time the chief musician of heaven. But a dude could sing. <laughs> the old joke is, among pastors anyway, when Lucifer fell out of heaven, he fell into the choir loft. <laughs> Because one of the most notorious places for spiritual problems in any church is from the music department. And I want to say that to say I don't believe we're having demonic problems in our music department. I want to say thank you to our musicians for endeavoring to serve God with cleanliness. But I do want to warn you that's where the biggest problems come. It's, 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 it's historical. And it's because it's spirit. Bring up 1 Samuel 16. You know the Bible says it came to pass when an evil spirit that, that was allowed by God is what that meant came upon Saul that David took his harp and played with his hand and Saul was refreshed and, and was well and the evil spirit departed from him because uh, some forms of music is a form of worship and it will chase devils. Other kinds of music attract devils. And Satan's biggest achievement is when he has been, is able to deal with people who lack discernment and be able to embrace music that is opening them up to demonic things uh, and think that it's Christian. Now that's his chiefest ability. I'll tell you another one that we don't... We never had to spend time talking about, but it's the 21st century. But another thing we do that, that, that has spiritual connotation is tattoos and piercings. Now again, I, I get into some of that in because we're his, but let me talk about the other. Do you know that right now in America there are more tattoo shops than McDonald's? It has exploded. And it seems that whatever musicians or sports figures do, I remember years ago, back in the 90s, when Michael Jordan showed up on a news thing with an earring in his ear. I, I discerned it immediately. I thought, here it goes. Here it goes. And sure enough, after a while, all the sports figures again, they're getting tattoos left and right. They don't have any normal skin left. And then all the kids want to be like them. And it just goes, and it explodes. Now, let, let me you say, well, well, well Pastor... Do we tattoo or not tattoo? Well, let me give you just one verse. 1 Samuel 16. I, I'm sorry, I, I read it. Leviticus 19. 
And by the way, uh, we already read something from Levit Leviticus 19, but let me add something to that. Uh, we understand in teaching about the Old Testament that there's the moral law of God and then there's a the ceremonial law of God. But when we study Leviticus 19, most of the things in Leviticus 19 are moral law issues. That means they have ap uh, application to us still in the New Testament. Here's verse 28. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. Everybody say, I'm God. Let me read you that verse in the Amplified Version. You shall not make any cuts on your body in mourning for the dead, talking about occultism or depression, even could be, nor make any tattoo marks on yourselves, for I am the Lord. The Message Bible. Even they got it right. Don't gash your bodies on behalf of the dead and don't tattoo yourselves. I'm God. <laughs> now again, I want to point out to the church, God does not owe us an explanation for why he has certain tastes. He said, the reason I don't want you to do it is because I'm God. What he's in essence saying, I'm God, that's what I like. That's what I want. That's what I expect out of you. And you don't need any further revelation from that if you love him. Now, if you don't really love him in your heart, you're going to fight like the Dickens to, to, to find a way around this. 1 Kings 18. This is the other side of it. They cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. You see, cutting and people that do it now, and they're even saying, you know, it's a mental illness. It's not a mental illness. It's, it's spirit-driven. It, and, and, of course, it becomes a mental weakness, but it's spirit-driven. In the old days, the cutting, and, and we know people that do it will say because the endorphins, it releases endorphins. But back in the old days, uh, they thought that doing that opened them up to the spirit world. You say, well, pastor, I didn't know. Okay, I mean, that's how it is sometimes. But here's what I want to ask the church. Do you ever consult the Word of God before making decisions? Is there anything that ever gives you pause and think, you know what, I, I don't see a whole lot of that in a church. Maybe I need to ask. You always, everybody say always, <laughs> need to examine the roots and the fruits of anything before you go buying into it and jumping on board. Now some, some balk at this and say, well, it, 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 but pastor, it's so accepted in society. It doesn't mean anything anymore. Well, okay, that's true. But then again, so is abortion. So is fornication, adultery, divorce. We all right with all of that too just because culture has accepted it? If I got one frustration with the church, it's, it's constantly trying to mature people to get out of this understanding of being so mesmerized by a world that is lost and heading to hell. Stop being so impressed with them. They will lead you straight to destruction while you're trying to be cool. And sometimes while you're trying to attract people and be cool what you don't realize is sometimes what you're actually attracting is the spirit world and you're going to get in over your head because you unwittingly attract things and cause them in essence you invite them to influence you uh, another example is, is, is obviously movies video games uh, central media all of these things are spiritually designed to snare us. No, it doesn't mean that at any time you, you've seen something or done something. It doesn't mean that you're demon-possessed. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, though, they're there to snare. Historically, and I did some research on this. I've been reading for the last several days because God started dealing with me last week about this. And historically, it, there is no question about it. No one argues this. Nobody's serious anyway. But tattooing has always been documented that roots itself back directly to paganism and occultism, shamanism, 
Baal worship. And it's a religious ceremony that throughout the world, throughout history, was predominantly done by the priesthood of these false religions. The interesting thing is, is that never in history has tattooing been associated with the Christian church. Never. As a matter of fact, historically, whenever Christianity rises in a culture or an area or a nation and revival takes place, uh, tattooing begins to disappear. Except for late 20th century American brand of Christianity. The kind that just wants all the fluff. But we don't want anything that's going to be inconvenient. When God created man, he said it is good. Thinking is, when we tattoo the body, when we pierce the body, do that kind of stuff, it's the same as you know, uh, contractors come along and build a wall. It's a beautiful wall. And when they're done, everybody's happy with it. It's just like the specs. I like my wall. And then somebody comes along with a can of paint and graffitis the wall. You say, is the wall still there? Yeah. But I promise you the people that made it are not happy. Oh, it's quiet. <laughs> We are made in the image of God. So tattooing endeavors to change that image. Piercing is endeavoring to change that image. And, and that's why toy makers have created washable ink trying to get children to... And, and again, I know there's fun little games we do with kids. I'm not trying to be over reactive here. But i got to be honest with you and tell you what that stuff is designed for is to get the mind of a child open to the idea for the real thing. Years ago, historically, it was said that young men in America had to almost go overseas most of the time, uh, many times connected with the military and so forth, in order to get a tattoo because it was so rare in America, there wasn't hardly any place you can go to get one except in big cities. Now, I'm going to read you two or three quotes that are interesting because they come from books that people have wrote as a pro-tattoo book. In other words, I'm not reading this from people who are, who are arguing the church's side. These are people that are happy about tattoos. They're bragging about tattoos. They're telling you the truth about tattoos. <laughs> this is from a book called Tattoo History. And I quote, The Tattooist. Shaman or the occult priest many times uses the tattoo as a point of contact or inlets into the spiritual world. The tattoo is much more than just a body decoration. It's more than just a layer of ink cut into a skin. In fact, the tattoo in every culture, in every country, up until the 20th century was a vehicle for pagan and spiritual religious invocations. Even today, in many countries, and, and, and that would even include us, the tattoo is believed to bridge into the supernatural world. Again, they're, they're writing as, isn't this cool? But the church ought to have some discernment. Michelle Delio in, in, uh, in, in Tattoo, the exotic art of skin decoration, she uh, wrote this. Tattooing is about personalizing the body, making it a true home and fit temple for the spirit that dwells inside it. Tattooing, therefore, is a way of keeping the spiritual and the material needs of the body in balance. Huh? <laughs> when the designs are chosen with care, Tattoos have a power and magic all their own. They decorate the body, but they also enhance the soul. That's not Christians writing that. That's the tattooist. Rolling Stone magazine wrote this about uh, Paul Booth during his tattoo. It says, allowing his clients demons to help guide the needle. That was his testimony. That was written... Uh, back in 2002. Now, let me, let me remind you about Leviticus 19. Bring up verse 28. Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you, for I am the Lord. This is simple, cut-and-dry stuff. What I've observed through the years 
is that many of us, uh, when we were, you know, in the world or away from God or whatever, we have tattoos and stuff. I've always observed through the years, so when people come into the church, all of a sudden they get embarrassed by them. They're trying to cover them up. They're trying to, you know. And, and by the way, just from, a, just from a logic standpoint, you know, you might want to really be careful about wanting to tattoo something that's never going to go away. Because you're assuming you're never going to think differently than you do when you're 20. <laughs> it's people that tattoo their girlfriend's name. <laughs> and then they break up. Oh, the misery that follows that. <laughs> but my point is that you're, we're toying with stuff. Now, again, I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad. There, we have many among the great saints of God. That have, the, the point is, though, but when we come to God, old things should pass away. We need to stop doing that stuff. Because Hosea 4 and 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I'll reject thee. God said, you'll, you'll not be a priest to me. Seeing you've forgotten my law, I will forget that you're my children. This is powerful stuff. Look, look, church, what we need is discernment. And it's why, if we are left to our own devices, we keep drifting worldly. Why? It's because things attract spirits. I've watched some women that are part of the church. And all of a sudden, I, I just happened to notice it all in, in one week. And God, I, I guess, brought it to my attention. Because on speed, I'm not walking around uh, paying attention to this as much as maybe I should as a pastor. But I, I've seen some of our ladies in here. I mean, people, that, women are prayer. And they got their toenails painted. And I'm thinking, why? First of all, if you're going to do your toenails, you might as well go ahead and do your fingernails too. <laughs> what, what is it you think is... is is, is le- but it's, it's just worldliness. Now, I, I don't have time tonight because I'm almost out of time, some of you which are very thankful for. <laughs> but I address that whole thing in Because We're His. You, you can go listen to that. But, but my point is, is that it, it's the craziest thing. If, if, something, if somebody isn't in our face about something, does somebody have to preach to you every two or three months, do not commit adultery, do not commit adultery, you commit adultery, you're going to hell. <laughs> At what point am I able to m- say, I got it. <laughs> I'll handle this one from here on out. <laughs> I don't need to be pestered. Now, all of us need a little remembrance every once in a while. It's good to remind us why we do something. But we shouldn't have to be reminded about basic Christianity every other month in order to maintain it. That's immaturity. Ezekiel 36. i got to hurry. I'm almost out of time. For I will take you from among the heathen, gather you out of all countries. I will bring you to your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all of your filthiness, and from all of your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart I'll give to you. This is the promise of the Lord to the church. I'm going to give you a new spirit. I'm going to take away the stony heart of your flesh. In other words, that hard-heartedness. I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. I'm going to put my spirit within you. That's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to cause you to walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. God said uh, to the Old Testament, uh, this is what I want because I'm God. He says to the New Testament, uh, this is what I want because I am within you. But it's still all about just pleasing God and deciding what you want to attract and what you don't want to attract. That's why when you skip down to verse 31, then you shall you remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good. And you shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for the iniquities and for the abominations. In other words, we shouldn't be bragging about the sin we used to be in. We ought to be embarrassed by the sin we used to be. For your sakes I'll do this, saith the Lord. As Paul Harvey used to say, down to the last page here. <laughs> we are called to be separate. Bring up Matthew 24 real quick. 
Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. There is so much deception that is going on under the guise of Christianity and the name of Christ by well-known pastors that even some of the people of God will say, well, so-and-so doesn't preach against this. and You know, some of those examples, you can't find me anything they do preach against. In a historical note, one historian wrote it this way. He said, going back to the tattoo for a minute, he said, you realize Christianity is the biggest en enemy of the tattoo business. Because wherever Christianity took root, that practice almost became non-existent. Because people come into the church and all of a sudden we feel like, you know, boy, I, I want to hide this. I'm not happy about this. But if you watch some of them grow lukewarm, all of a sudden they'll get bolder about it. They want you to see. Now they're going it by pride and ego. But with anybody for discernment, you just look at it and shake your head. And realize they don't even understand what they're in or what they're toying with. He that is ignorant, let him be ignorant still. There's sometimes you can't teach somebody that doesn't want to learn. Let me say it this way, 1 Corinthians 10. I just a couple of verses left. Um, Go down to verse 20. But I say that the things with the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. He's trying to tell us some things that will help keep you from engaging the spirit world. You cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partaker of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than He? All things are lawful to me, but not all things are expedient. Uh, all things are lawful, but not all things don't edify or edify not. Everything is not about immediate heaven or hell. It's about what are you attracting? Which direction is the tent of your home being pitched toward? Therefore, 2 Corinthians... Verse chapter 5, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And, and that's how it ought to be uh, with us. Now, I, I got to say, I'm, I'm, I've only got a couple of minutes left. If you musicians want to come, just super brief, or musician, brother Pop, if you want to come. I, I will tell you this, I'm, I'm out of time. And we haven't even begun to talk about all the stuff on that. We, we haven't talked much about modesty or immodesty. Though I probably need to have a freshen up session now that summer's here. <laughs> Don't have to worry about it a whole lot in winter. <laughs> Television, movies, drugs, alcohol. We haven't even addressed any of that. By the way, you think it's a coincidence? That they call liquor spirits? Duh! <laughs> we, we haven't even talked about horoscopes, astrology, fortune tellers, pornography. All of this stuff, and I, the, the list, there's more. But all of that stuff, this is where I'm getting to. We will eventually tend to engage what we attract. In computer business, there's a saying called security by obscurity. Get away with things because no one knows it's there. There's things in the kingdom of God that we have in security because of our obscurity to the spirit world. In other words, the spirit world's paying attention to something else. But there's certain things we begin to do that start drawing the attention of the spirit world toward us. And when that happens, we lose our security by obscurity. Because we're no longer obscure. 
All these life choices have spiritual consequences. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you to one last. I want everybody real quick, turn here to 1 Peter 3. This is my last passage. But this is real important. Because I want to talk real quick about our homes and our marriages in the last minute and a half that I have. And I, I've said this before. Most of the problems that we call marital problems are not. Most of the time, my observation is they're really spiritual problems. They're Christianity problems. And because our Christianity is sloppy, we're, we're, we allow things that should be able to be handled to become explosive. I wonder how much would vanish or at least be tamped down to a measurable level if we followed this advice. 1 Peter 3, 7. Likewise, you husbands dwell with them according to knowledge. Give honor to the wife as under the weaker vessel, as being heirs together the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Again, I'm just touching on the fact there are things we do. The Bible says a man mistreats his wife, his prayers are hindered because it attracts the wrong thing. It repels, it displeases God, so it repels his blessing. Verse 8. Finally, everybody say finally. Be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Be courteous. Be courteous. I wonder what that means in the original Greek. <laughs> Not rendering evil for evil, nor railing for railing, but contrarywise, or in other words, instead, blessing, knowing that ye are therefore called, that you should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it or pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Because when it comes to engaging the Spirit, there are things that we do that are either going to attract God's Spirit or they're going to attract the demonic spirit. They're going to please God and displease the devil, or it's going to please the devil and, and displease God. Bottom line, Christianity is not just going to church. It's about having a relationship with God that grows and matures. It's about learning what pleases and displeases and making an effort to do so. And therefore, my argument to the church tonight is when discussing engaging the Spirit, I think we need to be more passionate about making an effort to engage it correctly. Everybody said amen. Stand with me tonight. Before we dismiss... I want you to take a moment. I want you to close your eyes where you're standing. And I think before we walk out the door tonight, I do feel like it's important that we need to take just a moment. And I think we need to pray. Would you lift up your voice right now in the name of the Lord? Dear Jesus, I loose this important teaching tonight into the body of Christ. I loose this teaching to the ears of the people of God. I'm asking you, God, to deal with us and help us mature us so that we can move to another level of revival. Oh, that we would be conscious of things that we do that attract the wrong things. That we'd we be mindful of attracting the holy rather than the unholy. In the glorious name of Jesus. Now all over the house, clap your hands and shout unto the Lord of victory. Shout of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you for being faithful and loyal to the house of the Lord. God bless you tonight. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. We'll see you Sunday. It's going to be a great day in the Lord as we celebrate Father's Day. God bless. Hey, Caleb.